Happy Easter, Bedrock family. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Um, man, Brian and I wanted to say that we love you guys, and we are so thankful for the way that um, God has, in the midst of a time where we're not physically able to be together, um, God has continued to move the church forward. We hear so many stories, encouraging stories about the way that you're reaching your neighbors um, and about the way that you're interacting with each other, the way the disciples are continuing to be made. And so, and we are excited that in the midst of a time that um, could be very discouraging for people, um, God's continued to move. And honestly, I think God's going to use this season um, to really create a space in which His gospel and people are ready to hear it and His gospel could take root in a unique way. Um, and so we're excited about this Sunday as we prayed over um, what it looks like for us to kind of like as a church plant tackle um, coronavirus and what does that mean for our rhythms? We thought DNA has to be there, missional communities have to be there, but we couldn't pass up the opportunity um, to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus in, um, in Fishtown over, over a, a video. So um, yeah, to, it, is, it is awesome to be sitting in a Fishtown basement row home and um, to say that Jesus is alive, Jesus has risen, sin and death have been conquered, and we, as a return, have, have life because of that. And so today, um, I, I want to do something just, just simple. I, I want to I wanna communicate the story of the resurrection. Um, and then after that, we're going to ask one question. is what is the, How does the resurrection give us life today? And so... And we, we communicate through stories. This is one big story, everything tying back to Jesus. Um, but as people, we communicate through stories. I ask you how your day went, and you're probably going to tell me a story at some point about how you did something or you interacted with somebody. And I think the reason that we like to tell stories is because we want to do more than just exchange information. We want to, we want to do more than just hand you facts. We want, to, we want to relive something. We want to hear it, smell it, taste it, feel it. We want to place you there. Place you in a moment on a, on a long timeline. And I think the reason that we tell stories is because we realize that there is also a greater story that we are all a part of. And, and somehow as we tell these stories we realize that they contribute some kind of value, not only in that moment, but they contribute value to the present and to the future. We tell stories. And for, for us, at a time like that we're living in right now, people are going to tell stories about this time. People are going to tell happy stories about how people rallied around together. There was a moment where there, were no, there, there was no political parties. It was not... There was not as much division. It was we rallied together because because we had to. Um, people are going to tell sad stories about loved ones that were that were lost, and I'm sure medical professionals are going to have some very difficult stories that they're going to tell that point back to this time. There's going to be small businesses that point back ten years from now um, to how they're still recovering from this. We're going to tell stories, and so for us, the question is, what story will we tell? Not only what story will we tell then, because my desire would be that we would tell a story that, um, a story of, of how God used this time to shape his church, how God used this time to, again, the, the gospel took root in a unique way. But I think if we're going to tell that story, then we have to be faithful to tell the most important true story that we know, which is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, what is found in that story is living hope, a secure inheritance and future, and a joy that is inexpressible and, and filled with glory. That story is needed now. And so, before we jump into the Word, let's take a moment and let's pray together. Um, Father, we, um, we are grateful um, for everything that you are doing right now, even in the midst of a difficult time, um, Lord, you are writing your story. Um, and so, Lord, help us through the Holy Spirit to be faithful, to proclaim Jesus Christ to ourselves, to our families, to 
the church family that you've placed us in and to the communities that you've placed us in, whether that's Lynchburg or whether that's Fishtown right now. Um, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to communicate the story of Jesus Christ, the only story that provides real hope and life. So be with us today as, Lord, as, as we gather, the only way that we're able to right now, we gather around your word, in your name, amen. So we've been, as a missional community, we've been in Luke. Um, and one of, the, one of the themes that has risen to the surface is this idea of the great reversal. Um, and this is something that we see in Jesus' kingdom. We also see it from the beginning of time, that from the moment that sin enters the world, um, there is a restoration that is happening. But all of that ultimately culminates at Jesus' life. He's restoring. And he's making old things new. But at the same time, he's taking what we see. Um, he's taking the poor um, and, and he's giving them life and hope. And he's taking those who are sick and he's healing. And he's taking those who are captive and he's setting them free. Let's, let's look at Luke chapter 4. This is when, when Jesus steps into the synagogue and they hand him the book of Isaiah. And this is, this is what Jesus chooses to read for the very first time that he proclaims his arrival in the synagogue. So let's read it. Luke chapter 4, verse eight, starting in verse 18. It's just 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There it is. It's, I, I am coming to make things right again. And the crazy thing is it happens. And not like happens at some point, like it happens the very next chapter, not even chapter, the very, the very next story is about Jesus healing people. In the next two chapters, he heals a man with a withered hand. He heals the masses. He preaches the good news of the kingdom of God. He cleanses a leper and he heals a paralytic. And this is different. This is different than all the other teachers and healers that came before him. People, people taught and people healed before Jesus. But all the prophets pointed to a future king and all the false teachers had a false message. But what Jesus was doing was different. You see, Jesus spoke with authority that the prophets didn't have. And he healed with power that the false prophets only dreamed of. See, Jesus had authority and power. And with that, he announced a kingdom in which he was the king. Jesus was telling a different story and he was ushering in a kingdom that was unique. This kingdom was bringing about a great reversal, the great restoration of a world that had been broken over sin for a long, long time. Jesus announces who he is. He continues to heal. We see his authority in, in everything that he does, but specifically we see his authority over death. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 18, he says, no one takes my life, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it back up again. This charge I have received from my father. It's a foreshadowing of what was coming, but it's also communicating that I have an authority that is unique, an authority over death. We see him display this authority with the widow's son in Luke 4, um, with Jairus' daughter in Mark 5, and with Lazarus in John 11. And with Lazarus, the re one of the reasons I love that story is because of Jesus' in, uh, exchange with Martha, Lazarus' sister. You see, Lazarus dies, and, and Martha, um, Jesus is, is late in Martha's thinking, to the grave. And, and Martha comes to him, and, and she says, you should have been here. You should have been here. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says to him, he will rise again. And Martha says, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection. And what Martha is revealing in that moment is that, sure, she believes that there's going to be a resurrection, but she doesn't understand that the king of the resurrection is standing right before her. She doesn't understand who Jesus is. 
And so Jesus says these infamous words where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe? And Martha says, I believe you are the son of God. What Jesus is saying in that moment is that I know, Martha, that you've heard about a resurrection. But when I say that I am the resurrection, the resurrection does not happen apart from me. The life that is being granted in the resurrection, I possess. I have the authority. I have the authority and the power to give that. And he does. He gives it to Lazarus. And we see Lazarus rise from the grave. You see, Jesus, Jesus' message was different. His power was different. And we're gonna, and it's it's interesting to me that not only not only do we see that in Jesus' early life, but we also see this this king that has he he has a a, pers- a perspective of the future church and everything that the Lord is going to do, but he, he's able to sit with disciples alone in a room and minister to them. The way that Jesus walked the earth, the way that he interacted with the people that he cared for, we get a glimpse into that in Luke 22. Is they sit down for the Passover meal. And this meal is significant for Jewish people and for the Israelites, because what this meal represents was the story that was told in Exodus, where um, God preserves life, and He, as He calls people out of Egypt, um, and He, as He sends the angel of death over Egypt, and He takes all of the firstborn children in Egypt, and and God instructs His people. He says, "Go and kill." a a lamb and and take the blood and put it over the doorpost because that blood needs to be shed in order for your, your oldest son to be preserved. And, and so for, for many people and for the people that are sitting at this table, those disciples, this is not a meal that is taken lightly. That's not a covenant that, that preserved a nation. And, Jesus sits down to the sits down with them at this meal and he takes old things and he makes them new. So he takes the bread and he breaks it. And he says, "This is my body which is going to be broken for you." And he says, "Do this in remembrance of me." And then he takes the cup and he gives it and he says, "As you drink this, this is my blood of the new covenant." You know of the old covenant. This is the new covenant. And I am the lamb that is going to be shed for your life. This is the new covenant that is made for you. Drink this. And when every time you drink this, remember, remember what, what has happened. Um, they must have told stories about that night. They had to have constantly remembering the night when Jesus sat them down and for the first time told them, even if they didn't understand in the moment what was happening, they will always and forever remember that night. And they tell stories about it. From there, Jesus would go to the Garden of Gethsemane and he would pray and submit to the Father's will one last time. And then he would, he would be taken. He would stand before Pontius Pilate and and. They would trade a sinner's life, Barabbas. They would trade a a guilty man for one that is innocent, which is very clear of what is exactly the exchange that has happened for our life. Um, and they would take an innocent man in Jesus, and they would and they would whip him, and they would pierce his hands, and they would place him on a cross. And even on the cross, Jesus would proclaim, "Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they do." And then the the, the sinner that's standing right that is hanging on the cross right next to next to Jesus would look at Jesus and say. Remember me. Remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus would look at him and he would give him hope. He would say, truly, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And then Jesus would die. And that death serves as a sacrifice for the justice that we, and and the penalty that we all deserve because of sin. Jesus was innocent. Yet he died for us. 
and they take him to a tomb. And three days later, Martha and Mary come come to the tomb and, and they're sorrowful and they find that the tomb is open and there are two glowing figures, two angels that are there before him. And they say, why do you look, why do you search for the living amongst the dead? And they don't understand. And they're just like, I don't, I, Jesus, and they say, Jesus has told you what would happen. He would die and he would raise again. And then Jesus and Mary have an, have an exchange where, where he again says, I'm, I'm here, I'm alive. And Mary goes running back to tell the disciples, but they still don't believe. And then we see this interaction in Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus. Where there's this, the disciples are walking and Jesus comes up alongside them. And he asks them what they're talking about. And they're talking about Jesus because much like today, if you were to say, okay, so if someone were to be like, man, I... What are you talking about? Well, the only thing we really talk about right now is the coronavirus and the latest update. And if someone were to look at you and be like, man, I don't, what virus are you talking about? You would say, you're crazy. Where have you been living under a rock? Put on a mask. Here's some gloves. Um, but the same thing happens um, where they're, talk, they're, they're walking to Emmaus. It's outside of Jerusalem. And, and they're talking about Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus, even though they didn't, they didn't, he didn't allow them to see who he was. He says, who, who are you talking about? I say, Jesus. And, and Jesus begins to open their eyes to everything that he had already taught them, from Moses to the prophets, to everything that he had done. And he reveals to them the scriptures, but they still didn't perceive who he was. And then they invite him into their house. And he sits down, and he blesses the bread, and he breaks it. And in an instant, they remember. They remember the stories. They see who, he's, who he is. Their eyes are opened. They realize that Jesus has risen. They go running to the other disciples to proclaim Jesus has risen. And from this moment forward, there is an explosion of the gospel. The church takes root. The gospel begins to change lives. So today I want to remember together. I want to take a moment in the middle of this video and pause and remember that everything that we have hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he has given us a gift, a good gift, where we get the opportunity to break that bread and remember the body that was broken for us and drink the cup and remember the cup that in the, of the blood that was shed for us. If you look in 1 Corinthians, there's, uh, there's also a warning um, that we should not approach this table lightly. So if in this moment, if first you need to go and repent of any sins, if you need to spend a moment before the Lord and just say, Lord, I, I forgive me for forgetting. I need to remember your resurrection. Um, well, I would encourage you to do that before, we, before you um, take the sacraments. Um, we... Um, we're going to take a moment right now, or we're going to give you five minutes um, where you're going to have the time that you need to just go before the Lord, just you and Him, um, and remember.
So the question that we wanted to answer was, how does the resurrection give me life today? And to find that answer, we're going to go to 1 Peter. So if you can turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 3. We're going to go to verse 9. 1 Peter has an interesting context. The people that Peter is writing to, um, the elect exiles, as he refers to them, in Pontius, Galatia, and Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, um, they were people that were experiencing trials, is the way they describe it. There's multiple times that, G- that Peter refers to um, the re- not only the resurrection, the, the, re- the resurrection, the gospel, and he's like, man, in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your suffering, um, there's many things that you can lean on, but he, but he points to the joy that they should have in the midst of their suffering. So d- despite their circumstances, there is a foundation that could sustain them no matter what they face. And so Peter's writing, them, writing to them just simply to encourage them to be like, man, there's inheritance, there is a glory that awaits you. So let's, let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith and the salvation of your soul. There are so many encouraging things in that short paragraph but all of it either points to or points back to the resurrection look at what he says in first in in the very first verse he said blessed be the god the very first thing that we see is that the reader that peter's writing this is not for their praise but he says praise to god the father our lord and then our lord jesus christ according to his great mercy what is mercy That's when you do not receive something that you deserve. And so if grace is receiving something that you don't deserve, mercy is when you don't don't receive the penalty and the due justice, the judgment that we deserve. God has given us mercy. How? How has he given given us mercy? He caused us to be born again to a living hope. So the very first thing that we're going to see in this passage is the resurrection gives me hope in the present. The resurrection gives me hope in the present. Hope is a very high value right now. We're at a time that, um, man, every single time that I turn on the news, it feels like it's gloom and doom. And it, it feels in a sense that's changing a little bit. But one of the things that, um, one of the things that rose to the surface very quickly was how valuable and maybe, um, man, how we didn't value appropriately hope. Hope is valuable. One of the news stories that I saw even last night was um, the, the ship that was sent to New York, actually from Norfolk, Virginia. Um, it's called the, the U.S. Comfort. Um, and it was, it was just meant to be another hospital, another place with a bunch of beds and a lot of material, uh, a lot of like resources that they could use uh, for what's going on in New York City, which is kind of a hot spot, definitely a hot spot. And so um, as, as they sail this ship into New York City, there was one image that was captured where um, the Comfort, this massive ship with red crosses on it, um, is in front of the Statue of Liberty. And this image went viral. Um, and it didn't matter what political leaning you had. It was just an image that showed that in the midst of crisis, there was hope. Everyone wanted to see it. And so they asked the captain about it, and he was like, "You know, if hopes if hopes the best if hopes what we can offer, it's it is it is extremely um, it is our honor and it's our privilege to be able to do so essentially." And um, and it was it was interesting to hear 
his perspective on all of this. He said, as we sailed into New York City, people began to lean out of buildings and cheer and scream because what they saw as they rolled in was hope. Hope is valuable. You don't need to be a believer to, to know that. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to know that. But I will say this, that the hope that the world offers is different than the hope that Jesus offers. You see, the hope that the world offers is, is oftentimes goes like this. I, I hope that the Eagles win the Super Bowl. Um, I hope that it's a nice day tomorrow. Man, I hope that my kids do well in, in school. Um, and, and the thing about all of these hopes is while they may have some kind of, um, while they may have some, ki- some kind of support as to what could possibly happen, all of those hopes are, are really based on um, just desire. But and aspiration and and just in the end, it's it's just we really don't have any control over it. But what we see with Jesus and the hope, the living hope that's being talked about here, um, is that this is a hope that is not rooted in just desire. This is a hope that is actually rooted in something that's real and that's genuine, and it's not vain, and it's not empty. This is a hope that is that it stands firm on the foundation of the gospel and truth. And the word that Peter uses to describe it is that it's living. It says that it's alive. And by nature, if a hope is alive and if it's full, that means that it's growing and that means that it's fruitful and that means that it is it is having an impact on the life of the one that holds it and also on, on the things that are in the people that are around it. This hope changes not just us, but it changes the people that we interact with because in a world that is full of empty hope, there is a real, genuine hope in Jesus Christ that can be trusted. One of the things that we say about hope is that hope has a secret and the secret that hope has is that it's only as strong as the object or the thing that you place it in. So if the thing that you place it in is not able to sustain you in its moment of crisis, then that hope ultimately was empty. But what we see all throughout the Gospels and we see in the resurrection is that not only did Jesus say that he would rise, but he did. And he showed himself to people afterwards. And there's a whole legacy of the growth of the Gospel that was born, not just out of people that believed some myth, but it was born out of a moment, a moment that Jesus died and rose from the grave, the Holy Spirit's handed to him, and the church is born. This hope is alive, it's growing, and it's real. And you have it in you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And we so easily forget. We forget that that that's the hope we have. I like sometimes to think about hope hope as an asset, like something that you possess. And we have a choice. You choose to place your hope in Jesus, but daily you also have that choice. Am I going to today lean on Jesus or am I going to place my hope temporarily in something else? This is what our world's going through right now, where we are, we are currently placing our hope in whatever else we have, right? Because finances are kind of there's they're insecure our job is insecure our social circles are gone Um, we're interacting with each other in a way that is just not comfortable for us and so there's a lot of anxiety and insecurity and the question is can I just put my my hope in something that will that will give me life and maybe not life sometimes we even settle just for rest we just want to pause like put 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 everything on pause and what we're finding is that They just don't offer that. The world does not know that hope. But Jesus does. And so daily, as you meet with your DNA group, as you're in your missional community, hold each other accountable, not to just saying that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but ask yourself this question, what are you placing your hope in today? Are you placing your hope in the resurrection? Do you reflect on the resurrection? Do you remember This remembering the resurrection is not something that just happens in a somber moment. This is something that demands a response. How are you responding to the resurrection by the things that you place your hope in? 
The next thing that we see here, like we said, everything works through in 1 Peter 3 through 9, everything works through the resurrection. The next thing that we see is the resurrection secures my future. And Peter just could not, he, he couldn't say it enough. Um, he says it like 16 different ways here. He says in verse, starting in, we're actually going to continue in verse 3. He says, according to the great mercy that he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you interesting to me that all of those things, the opposite of that would be everything that we experience in this world that is perishable, defiled, fading, and we can't secure anything or keep it on ourselves, keep it ourselves. Because you know what, as Jesus said, that we, we live in a world where, where thieves come in and steal and steal and, and moths come in and steal and, and destroy. And so I, I, I want you to remember right now that it is significant that Peter says that the security, your inheritance, the kingdom that we are going to be a part of because Jesus rose from the grave, that we too will rise from the grave, that is secure. And that changes things for us. Because like we said, there's this great reversal happening through Jesus. Whereas life used to lead to death, now our death leads to life. And we used to think, man, I can do everything I can now because my future isn't secure. Now we can look at our secure future and it gives us a foundation to stand on in the present. So the inheritance that we have in the future changes things for us. God has made a promise to us and he's delivered on that promise over and over and over again. So in the moment where it seems like everything else is crumbling around you, you can look, you can keep your eyes focused ahead and say, there is an inheritance that is more valuable than anything else this world has to offer me. So no matter what I'm going through right now, I am secure in the Father who gave mercy through Jesus, who died on the cross and, and he rose from the grave. There is an inheritance for me. So our future is secure. And then on top of that, at the very end, at the very end of this passage, he says, man, we rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. The joy that Jesus gives is, again, different the reason that I say that it's different is because what he also talks about in this passage is not only do you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible, but man, that doesn't mean that you're not going to go through things. That was never the promise. There's going to be trials. That's, that's the reason that Peter is writing this, that there are trials that the church is currently going through. But if you were to just look at them and say, just be joyful, and they would have nothing to grasp onto. But if he looks at them and he says, there is a God who's given you mercy through Jesus and that Jesus came and he rose from the grave and now you have a hope that is secure, a future inheritance that is unfading and because of that you can have joy that in and of yourself you could never even imagine. And that joy is not just filled with yourself and your, your own thoughts and whatever you can conjure up. He says this joy is filled with glory. It means that the very God of the universe displayed his glory through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. He is displaying that glory through the joy that he gives you. So when you interact with each other and when you interact with the people that God has called you to here in Fishtown in Lynchburg, man, it is important that we, we understand that the resurrection is what gives us life today. And as a result of that, there is a joy that can be physically seen on us. And the things that we do and the things that we say, God has made us new. 
In Peter's words, he says that we've been reborn. We've been reborn, which if you follow in this passage, you can see so much of this has nothing to do with us. He is the one that's given mercy. He is our Father. He has, he has re, reborn and given us new life. And so as, as we move into um, celebrating, not just on Sunday today, um, but we move into a, a continued season where we're, we're transitioning. We know the season we're in. Um, where our, our group, there's, part, there's some of us here and there's some of us in Lynchburg, some of us that long to be here and some of us here that are just still finding our footing. I want to remind you that, man, in, in, in the midst of all of this, what God has always desired for you to know more than anything else and to experience more than anything else wasn't to be part of a church plant. And a church plant is that's a good thing and it's part of the reason that Man, part of the thing that God is using to restore his world, his church. But what he's always desired most is that you would know him, that you'd know the power of his resurrection, that you would experience that hope, that you would know that your future's secure, and that out of that there would be a joy that only God can explain. So that's that Brian and I, as we prayed for, for this for this week, and as um, Brian's gonna get a chance um, two weeks from now where we're gonna we're gonna do another video and we're, he's gonna talk a little bit about okay, so what happens after the resurrection? So like what does the church look like as it as it grows? What does the Great Commission mean for us? Um, we're gonna be in the end of the end of Luke and Jesus' final words to his disciples and the encouragement and the power that he sends them in. Um, but for for for, the, for this week and for this time, man, I, I, I want you to just take a moment and remember. Remember the resurrection. Your remembrance has, it has to, it requires a response. So how will you respond? What does it look like you for to take an, another step towards Jesus today? How do you respond to the resurrection? Let's celebrate it together. It's life and it's hope. Finally, we talked about stories. We tell stories. And so tell this story. Tell it over and over and over again. Tell it to each other. Tell it to yourself. Listen to the Lord as he continues through his word and through the Holy Spirit to tell it to you and communicate it to everyone else around you because we live at a time that people need to hear this story. Not that they haven't always needed to hear this story, but people are looking for hope. I think we have a unique window right now where people are reminded once again that they are human and that they're, the things around them aren't quite as secure as they thought they were and people are looking for hope. And we have it. We love you guys. So excited to be able to do this. Um, so excited about the, what the Lord's doing through Bedrock Fishtown. So grateful for the resurrection. Let's pray. Father, we are reminded again today that um, the resurrection is everything to us, um, that it, it does give us life. And Lord, I, I pray that, um, Lord, I, I pray that as, as we reflect on your word, as, as your Holy Spirit continues to teach us, um, Lord, that there would be a joy in us, a hope in us, Lord, a, Lord, a perspective that we have, an eternal perspective um, that would not just shape us, but in turn would shape the whole world around us, Lord, that you would use us to shape other people's lives, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel, Lord, as we, Lord, as we take steps of faith, that we would realize that this was never about doing things for you. This was always about being with you, being yours. And so, Lord, uh, we rejoice today in knowing that we are yours. We're followers of Jesus. We love you, Lord. In your name, amen.